How many of you know the Bible tells us that it's by Jesus' stripes we are healed? <laughs> Amen. I'm just excited this morning to see Miss Brindy Dietz. After many, many weeks. Can you make him a shout to Jesus this morning? Come on. Come on, Quarterstone. He sent his word and he healed us and he delivered us from all our destruction. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, let's stand to worship today. You know, David said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell where? In the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And here we are gathered in God's house this morning. I got good news. Goodness and mercy followed you here this morning. The goodness and mercy of God chased you here this morning. Tell your neighbor you're in the right place. <laughs> hey, let's just invite God in this house today. This is the Lord's house. Let's raise our hands to heaven. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, that we got to come to your house today, that yes, this is Lord. the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, Father God. And we thank you, Lord God, that when Christ gave his life and he breathed his last, when he said it is finished, Lord God, that the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, giving access to the very throne room of God. And so we come today to the throne of grace through the mighty name of Jesus, through his shed blood and we exalt you here today Lord Jesus and we invite your presence and your anointing and your power come Holy Spirit be poured out in all flesh today we believe you Lord God the Pentecost is alive here today Father God in Jesus name and that you're the same yesterday today and forevermore and the same works you did back then you do right now and so we invite you Holy Spirit come invade this place come Lord God and and draw us to you, save and heal and sanctify and spirit fill your people here today, Lord God. And we believe you, Lord God, in Jesus' name for a mighty move of your spirit, Father God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name we pray and we expect it in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Are you ready to worship Cornerstone? The front is open, the aisles are open, the altars are always open. One, two, three, four.
leads us to repentance, God. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient with us. Even, Lord, when we have made foolish decisions in our life, God, thank you, Lord, for sparing me, for sparing us, Lord, when we did not deserve it.
Good morning, church. Happy Pastor Appreciation Sunday to to all of our pastors in the room, past and present. Uh, We just want to honor you today. So be mindful at don't run off at all, after, during altar because we will have a pastor appreciation presentation at the end of service, and you don't want to miss out on that. Would you all just bow your heads with me in prayer? Actually, let's stand up. Okay, stand up and just give the Lord some praise for a minute. Lift your hands. Give him some praise in the house. Father God, we just honor you in your house today, Lord. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to move about us even more so than you already have. Holy Spirit, speak through me the words that you have for this people today. For, For the world is so dark, Lord, and we need your encouragement. We need your power, and we need to know how to use your authority, Lord God. And we know need to learn how to walk in love and darkness, Lord. So, Lord, just speak to your people today. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive as, as you speak your word through me, Lord. Keep me out of your way, Lord. I cast down any strongholds in this room in the mighty name of Jesus. Your word, words will not come back void. We shall see you move in this place today, Jesus. We came hungry for you, and we came expecting with expectant hearts, Lord, because we need you in these last days, Lord God. We just praise you and glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. Good morning, church, again. Today we're going to be talking about the carry-through to your breakthrough. That's the title of my message today. It's called The Carry Through to Your Breakthrough. I was reading uh, some things. I like to read jokes. I'm like the worst dad joke giver ever, and I can never remember them. And there's a day at work when, when we take turns giving the joke of the day, and everybody expects in my unit full of women for me to have the dad joke, right? So I always am looking up dad jokes. And I heard this. So I heard a show host give the top 10 signs that your pastor didn't have time to study this week. And we're going to count down from 10 to 1. Are you ready? The number 10 reason or sign is he tells the ushers to take the offering twice. (laughs) Number 9, during the children's sermon, he serves cake and ice cream. (laughs) Number 8, he asks you to give a 20-minute testimony. (laughs) Number seven, during his pastoral prayer, he prays for your government officials, listing every member of Congress by name. (laughs) Number six, he wears his reading glasses for the entire sermon. (laughs) Number five, the sermon sounds eerily similar to the one I heard Hagee preach on the radio last week. <laughs> Number four, instead of preaching, he decides to show slideshows from his last vacation. <laughs> Before preaching, he takes 15 minutes reviewing last Sunday's sermon. Number two, even he's falling asleep. <laughs> and the number one reason that your pastor didn't have time to study this week is if you didn't know any better, you'd swear he was lip syncing to Charles Stanley. (laughs) And no, that's not why I'm preaching today. I want to honor Pastor John today. But all all jokes aside, let's review last week's sermon. (laughs) Do you mind (laughs) reviewing last week's sermon? Today I want to talk to you and convince you that there's one word that is the most dangerous word that you could ever say in your walk of faith, ever. And that is the word almost. Everybody say almost. That is the dangerous word that you could ever say to yourself in any situation is almost. Last week, Pastor John (laughs) preached about riding on the fence. And about, he he spoke on on the scripture of the Lord either wants you hot or he wants you cold. If you're lukewarm, 
What does he do? He's going to spew you out of his mouth. But what is the difference? What's that little extra carry through to get us to that fire that we need? What, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to stop saying almost, right? Fence riding is very dangerous. And I want to get a little bit heavy with you for a second. It's dangerous if you're riding the fence. The Bible tells us you can't serve two gods, right? Well, let's think about it of a minute and put it in current context. I take you to a country that is actively in war. Some of you might say that it's Israel, which I'll talk about Israel in a minute, but it's the United States of America. And we're in war, not only physically, but spiritually within our legislation, but we're also in war at our border. You see, at the border, it's dangerous. There's calamity and chaos. There's sickness. And people, there's a bunch of people that just do not know who they are. And they're just flooding in to find out that they're, they feel like they have no hope at this, at this border. Let's fast forward to Israel. When we go to Israel, Hezbollah is at their north border. And at the north border, they evacuated entire towns and cities within a two-mile radius of the border. Why? Because it's dangerous. Are any of you ready to start moving back from your border? A lot of you have been saying, well, when you're riding the fence, this is what you're saying to yourself. And the Lord clearly gave, gave me this. Many of you are calling your fence riding boundaries. Boundaries. Well, I can't do that. What would they think of me? If a man surrenders at the altar, it would show that I'm weak. What if I cry if I surrender to the Lord? What would happen if the Holy Spirit just overcomes me and I act crazy? What would people think of me? You know, I would have no control. I wouldn't. I, I, I. It's a boundary. It's a wall. And that, that boundary that, you're, that you've created and that you're calling your fence riding is the exact thing that's keeping you apart from the Lord. It's keeping you from your carry-through to your breakthrough. There's many of you uh, oldies in here that you've sat in here and you've prayed and you're still struggling with the same stuff. And it's because you haven't laid everything down. You've put borders up, people. I'm, I'm talking to you today. You have put borders up and went through the motions instead of getting out of your seat and moving upon what the Lord's told you to do. And you could have been the only one that could have reached that person. And we're not doing a good job, church, if we're just sitting in our seat, putting up that boundary that we call boundaries. But really, in reality, it's fence riding because it's disobedient to the Lord. And that's sin. That's sin. Let's call it like it is. That's sin, right? I almost went to the altar and asked for healing. I almost asked the Lord into my heart today. I can do that later. I have a boundary. I got to get figure some things out first, right? My love life's a mess. I got to put that figure out that first before I choose the, my first true love, right? Boundaries. Almost is the most dangerous word. What if the woman at the well would have said, or not the woman at the well? The woman that wanted to touch his garment said, I almost touched his garment. She wouldn't have received anything. Her faith was broken. The almosts in your life are stalling out the answers of your faith. It's stalling your faith. That mustard seed is only, it has a glass ceiling and it can only go so far and grow so far. You want to know why? Because you've put it there. You've put that boundary there. You've put that border there. And so your faith's only gone so far. And you're not talking to God about it because your faith has only gone so far. You've learned to live with it. You, 
It's became your norm. Well, these thoughts are just something that I have all the time. This depression is just something I have all the time. No, that's not acceptable. Jesus says, come to me, you ask and you shall receive. Receive, and we should. But how do we get there? It's hard, right? I'm talking to you right now, but it's hard when you're that person and you're, you're like, how do I get out of this rut? How do I get out of this circumstance? How do I get out of this dark place? And the answer through is point number one, church. Let the Holy Spirit carry you through. Let Holy Spirit carry you through to your breakthrough. Many of you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, the Lord told me. So we're going to talk about him for a little bit, if that's okay. And John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus says this, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. He dwells with you and will be with you. You see, Jesus was telling his disciples, I'm going to the Father, and I'm going to, going to ask him to send you a helper, since I was your helper here on earth. I'm sending you a helper, capital H. Jesus assures that the Holy Spirit is just to help them, and he tells the disciples that the Holy Spirit's going to be with them and live inside of them. There's a difference. Jesus says, you will know him because he lives and will be in you. Jesus told his disciples this. However, these words were meant for us too. You know, the truth of the Holy Spirit living with us and in us assures us that we never have to feel alone. And there is a difference between the Holy Spirit being upon you and within you. So, so first of all, church, the way the Holy Spirit's going to carry us through to our breakthrough is he, he's a helper. And just how does he help? Well, he, he'll help us hear God's voice and God's word in the hard times. That's the main thing that he does. There's a slew of other things and gifts that he does, but that's one of the main things that he does. And the second thing that I want to touch on, because it's been a major lie and stereotype in the church, so I'm going to hit on it today, is that the Holy Spirit is a friend. He is a friend, but the church has stereotyped it. Satan is the author and the maker of deceptions and stereotypes. Did you know that? It is Satan that wants you to think that inviting Holy Spirit into your life has little to do with friendship. But that is exactly what it is. You see, Satan is the one that would convince you that giving the Holy Spirit a role in your life turns you into a weirdo. Think about it. If the helper and friend, the Holy Spirit, is so vital to us, and such a wonderful thing that the enemy would want to keep you from experiencing that help, wouldn't he? Yeah. After all, one aspect of the Holy Spirit's works is to get, convince us, listen, this is why you need us, to convince us that Satan has been judged and stripped of his authority. That's right. He's been judged and stripped of his authority. And guess who has been given authority? You. You. So, of course, Satan doesn't want us to have a relationship with Holy Spirit. Makes sense, isn't it? The Holy Spirit isn't weird. And there's amazing benefits. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. The first benefit is power. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You see, sadly, many of us struggle our whole Christian life, and experience all kinds of failure because we try to live it with our own strength. You can be saved and go to heaven without the Holy Spirit, yet you will live lives of defeat and ineffectiveness. Die and go to heaven. You want to live a defeated life your whole life and then just die and go to heaven? Be my guest. 
Without the Holy Spirit, you would spend your entire life without ever using the only power that makes victorious and abundant living possible. The second benefit is love. You see, it's hard to love somebody that you don't really care for. The Bible's famous love chapter is 1 Corinthians 13, which is sandwiched between two chapters that deal with the gifts of the Spirit, believe it or not. And according to Romans 5.5, 5, the Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to walk in, love, in the love of God towards others. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Many Christians struggle to walk in love because, guess what? We've never opened our heart up to Holy Spirit. Amen. We've never opened up our heart. And we need this in this last days, don't we, church? We need this carry through to our breakthrough. If we have power and love and a friend and a helper, surely to goodness, that darkest day is going to be more bearable to get through and carry you through. And the next thing I want to talk, yeah, amen. We need the Holy Spirit. The next thing is I want to talk to you about fruit. Galatians 5.22 says, when we allow the Holy Spirit to fully dwell in our lives, he produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and I'm paraphrasing, and a whole host of other good things, right? The Holy Spirit can even help you with your emotions during that time because a lot of times in situations, our emotions are a lie. Our emotions are a lie in certain situations. So, so we need the Holy Spirit to get us through to where we're, we're of a sound mind. We're not allowing and acting on our emotions, you see, the fruit of the Spirit is a gift. The qualities that He produces in our lives are like, I, I look at them as like little packages from heaven in itself. And it's like you open it up and it's just filled with blessings, miracles, and powers. Do we need to see that in our church today? Blessings, miracles, and powers. Do you guys believe that that can happen to you today? Do you believe that you can receive those today? You know, you guys could turn this world upside down if you allowed him to work and move through you. Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives to move and get us through and be our carry through, to be victorious. Yes. Amen. And the, there are hard times that I want to talk about in, in life and in preaching and ministry in general since it's Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Here you all go. There are truly no shortcuts in preaching and ministry. It takes determination, calling and grit, and boy are there hardships, valleys, and mountaintops. I don't know about you guys, but I love preaching from mountaintop moments. The church is energized, the atmosphere is awake, and you all are listening. But Paul shows us the hardships that he had to face while in ministry, which leads me to this next point. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to carry out our calling during hardships. Allow Holy Spirit to help carry out your calling. Pastor John recently preached on not comparing ourselves to, to each other's callings or ministries. We are all called and equipped for specific ministries and duties. We all are called no matter where we are at in life. Do not let your circumstances stop you from walking out and sharing the gospel of Jesus. So we're going to be talking out of the text today, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. And this is talking about Paul's hardships. You see, 2 Corinthians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Corinth. They were, there were some people in, the, in his church that frequently criticized him. They suggested that the instructions that he gave the Corinthian church were less important than the teachings of the other apostles. So, what does Paul need to do? Paul needed them to understand that he was representing Christ 
as an official apostle so that they would not only respect him, but obey his teaching. So he was in an awkward position of having to say things that would prove to them that he was an apostle. In the passage, Paul is comparing himself to the other apostles, showing he had endured just as much or even more for the gospel than the other ones. So starting in verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I had been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, and in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, and fasting often, and cold and nakedness, beside the other things that comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? So to bring some of those points out that he just shared, I'm going to briefly sweep over, and if you're taking notes and like to go back during the week, you're going to want to write these uh, verses down because I'm just going over them quickly. Acts 9.16 tells us that God had sent a man named Ananias to disciple and train Paul shortly after Paul had his dramatic conversion. His dramatic conversion took place in Acts 9, 1 through 9. Ananias was reluctant to go. But God reassured him that he had a plan for Paul, but his plan included intense suffering. Acts 14, 19. This is a description of one of the times that Paul was stoned. Acts 16, 16 through 34. Paul arrested, beaten with rods, and was put in prison. Acts 27, 27 through 34. 44. This is a description of one, one of Paul's shipwrecks. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, Paul tells the church at Philippi that he was often without money to buy food. Does that relate with anybody? Some, some of those hardships? Yeah, I'm sure. But it's hard to imagine some of those horrible situations, like being stoned while you're telling the gospel, or shipwrecked and all those things, those are almost unheard of. But Paul did experience all of them while sharing the good news. He did not stop. What got him through, church? The Holy Spirit carried him through to his breakthrough or victory. See, in addition to all these hardships, this is where I want you to listen closely because this is the most important. There is one more. That I want to focus on. You might be thinking to yourself, what the heck else could there be? After beating, stonings, and shipwrecks, what else did Paul endure that was almost more unbearable than those? Well, in verses 28 and 29, he says, besides the other things, what comes upon me, upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? The one thing that is hard on Paul, as these other hardships is, is the daily burden of how the churches are getting along. Another text, the NET translation says it like this, and I like this because I can relate to it. The daily pressure on me of my anxious concern, is my anxious concern for all my churches, is my anxious concern for my church. Paul is saying that his physical hardships do not, are no more difficult than his constant concern for his people. 
To reinforce this point, Paul adds a couple of illustrations of his constant concern in voice, verse 29. Paul is so concerned about others that he bears their burdens as if they were his own. When people are weak or sick, he shares their pain. When people are led into sin, he gets emotionally involved. Paul carries the heavy burden of all the sorrows, failures, joys, and pains of each person in his churches. Paul's concern is like the daily concern of a parent for their children. For example, dropping your child off for the first time for their first day of school. You might be emotional. You might be worried about their day and share in their nervousness or joy. All day long you're wondering what's happening. Paul carries those same kinds of concerns and thoughts with him about the people in his churches. Though Paul was an apostle, he first and was foremost importantly a pastor. As a pastor, he considered the daily concern for people in his congregation to be as difficult to bear as being beaten or shipwrecked. And as you might expect, this is true of all pastors. This is true of our pastor. It is obvious that Pastor John loves each of us, is concerned for us. He prays for us and thinks about us. This is only what we see, but that's not all that there is. You see, Pastor John walks with us in ways we cannot understand. His concern for us is so deep and so powerful that the thoughts of us even keep him up at night. He reads or watches TV with us in mind at times. He worries that we will read the latest new book or the newest trend and be led astray from the truth. His emotions rise and fall every time someone from his congregation goes into the hospital for test. He grieves with those who have lost and he rejoices with those who get a new beginning. Pastor John moves from a funeral to a wedding rehearsal as a professional. He is outwardly dignified, showing just the right emotion for the right occasion. But inside, he might be dealing with the grief of a family and overwhelmed with excitement of the couple to be married. He urges the couple toward fidelity and faith, and he shepherds the grieving family through anger resentment, denial, and grief. And he carries all of those emotions and all of that concern around him with, with him every day. In our lives, we take, typically endure one or two significant events at a time. We might change jobs, get married, attend a funeral, have money problems, struggle to hold our marriage together, or love a rebellious child. But Pastor John experienced each, experiences each and every one of these things every day. He is concerned for the marriage in trouble. He desperately wants to, to relieve our financial struggles. He grieves with us over our troubled children. He rejoices with us when we find a new job. He experiences all of these things each day because he is so burdened for each of us. Our pain and our joy, joy becomes his because he cares for us so much. Today is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We, of course, ap appreciate Pastor John for all that he does. But Paul reminds us that, that what, we don't, what we see doesn't even compare to the intense concern that he has for each of us. Now, I hope the pastor is not at the point where he would rather be shipwrecked than rather be with us. <laughs> but this morning, on behalf of the entire congregation, I would, like, I would like to tell you thank you, Pastor. We genuinely appreciate everything we see you do for us. But even more, thank you for caring so much that you take our burdens as your own and that you intercede for us every day. 
Thank you for your selfless sacrifices that you make every day to lead us closer to Christ. We, we love you, Pastor John and Sarah. At, yes, we love them. Don't we? At this time, I would like the worship team to come up while I talk just for one last minute. Altars are open as we worship, and we need to cast our cares upon Jesus because he cares for us, church. God is worth all the trials. He is worth it. Don't let your own most be your own no. Don't let your own most be your own no. Allow the Holy Spirit to come upon you and empower not only you but your family today for generations to come. Let's see real change and miracles today in this place, church. Come rest at the feet of Jesus today as, as we come to carry out our calling. So these altars are open. Please come. Receive a re refilling of the Holy Spirit. Receive what the Lord has for you. Get rid of that almost. Get rid of that boundary. Allow the Lord to work in your life today. Allow him to move on your behalf today because the Holy Spirit's in this place, but he's waiting on just one step, on one person just to say, you know what? Instead of almost, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Do what only you can do, Jesus, because I can't do it on my own anymore. I can't do it on my strength, own strength anymore. I need your power. I need your guidance, Lord. I need your wisdom. I need your peace. I need your help. I need a friend in times of trouble that won't, will, that will always be there for me. Jesus, we need you. Can we just be in one mind, in one accord right now and just say, Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, work on us today. Come fill us, Lord, today. Come be with us, Lord, and rest upon our praise as we worship you. You are worthy to be worshiped, Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords, you are worthy. You are worthy.